Hola, hola. All right, we're back. Hopefully you guys can hear me good. Let me adjust this real quick. Okay. Testing. All right. So we're going to be covering or watching really just this hearing on Karen Reed that happened today. A lot of people feel that this woman should be free, that she should have been charged. And um, I was even looking at the comment section of this, one of the news channels. Let show you here. No way a jury will find her guilty. Canton will be accepting a lot of resumes soon. It's insane that our tax dollars are being wasted on the prosecution of this innocent woman. Shame on the commons wealth. Stop trying to railroad this innocent woman. Judge is biased. This story, I don't know too much about it. Welcome, everybody. Did you get a notification, by the way? I think I have a notification for this live stream. I don't have one for the next one, I believe, unless I'm wrong. Yeah, there's one notification for this one. So, a Boston business school fiance professor has been charged with the manslaughter. This is an old article for allegedly running over her cop boyfriend and leaving him for dead in a snowbank after dropping him off at a friend's home for a party in the early hours of Saturday morning while Nor'easter raged across Northeast. Yeah. While Nor'easter raged across Northeast. Northeast. Karen Reed, 41 years old at the time, I guess, a fiance lecturer at Bentley University, as well as an equity analyst at Fidelity, is accused of running over her boyfriend of two years after dropping him off at a property in a suburban Boston house for an after party following a car, sorry, a bar crawl, then calling 911 early the next morning. John O'Keefe, 46 years old, who was a soul, who was the soul carrier to his niece and nephew and who was a 16 year veteran Boston police officer was found unconscious in a snowbank at 6 a.m. on Saturday with skull fractures, swollen eyes and hypothermia. Temperatures in the Boston in Boston had dipped as low as 23 degrees Fahrenheit and as much as 21 inches of snow fell in the area later that day. He was taken to Good Samaritan Hospital at Brockton, where he was pronounced dead several hours later. So this whole story is like a mess. People that have been covering this, I haven't really covered this much. I am going to cover the trial. And I was even thinking that it might be interesting to cover if I guess that's supposed to happen in April. It might be interesting to cover the trial just based on what's being presented at the trial. Because there's a lot to this story. Marcy says justice for Karen Reed. You got the notifications. Cool. I'm going to send out an email notification as well. True. True. Uh, prosecutors said during Reed's arraignment on Wednesday that her and O'Keefe, who was an off-duty, or who was off-duty, had visited two bars in the early hours of Saturday morning before going home at 34 Fairview Road in Canton, two miles away from where O'Keefe lived. Reed chose not to attend, citing stomach issues, according to the prosecution. Property records reveal the home where the party was held is owned by someone with the same name as a veteran Boston police sergeant, though the Boston Police Department would not confirm. The circumstances of O'Keefe's death are under investigation. Reed recalled to the investigator she dropped off O'Keefe around 12.45 a.m. before making a three-point turn and left. She added that she did not see O'Keefe go inside the house. That's O'Keefe right there. Um, maybe the next time I cover this or when we cover the trial, I'll pull up an appropriate timeline. There's this woman on Twitter. I don't know if I don't know if it's Sleuthy Goosey is the one. I don't know if she did it. Somebody did a really good timeline on this. So when the time comes, we'll, we'll get into it. And it's been a mess. Let me see which audio is better. And I think they made a motion to dismiss 
the Chargers. I think it's what her team is doing today. When it began, I've also read the pleading. So let me listen to this one. I think that might be better. There might be a lot of background noise. By the way, how's my audio sound? Is it all right? Should be, hopefully, it's good and clear. Adam Lally for the Commonwealth. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Lally. <clears throat> good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Laura McLaughlin for the Commonwealth. Good morning, Ms. McLaughlin. Good morning, Your Honor. Alan Jackson for the Street. Good morning, Mr. Jackson. Good morning, Your Honor. Attorney David Yannetti for Karen Reed. Good morning, okay. Mr. Yannetti. We'll have to check her out. Good morning, Your Honor. Elizabeth Little, also on behalf of Ms. Reed. Good morning, Ms. Little. Good morning, Ms. Reed. All right. So... When we were last here on February 26th, uh, I first anticipated that today would be for all motions, but I did read the very detailed affidavit from defense counsel regarding dates and what we should. Miss says the cops at the party and homeowner sold house not long after this. So, oh, person who had camera lived across the street was a cop too. Damn. Wow cover and so today i as you know i changed some of the dates to accommodate you uh to accommodate i think there was a some short trial dates you may have had or restitution dates and so you did get the order on the new dates um so today is only for filing all rule 17 motions and for the motion to dismiss under odell and the motion for sanctions so I don't remember if it was Mr. Jackson or Mr. Yannetti who last time said that I was operating from a blind spot because I didn't have the information that was disclosed to you folks um, from the U.S. Attorney's Office. So you were good enough to get me the entire packet, which I appreciate. Uh, I read it. Um, I see now how the federal investigation began and when it began. I've also read the pleading, so the motion to dismiss, defendant's motion to dismiss is around 50 pages with attachments. The supplement is about 15 pages. The Commonwealth's opposition is about the same. The motion for sanctions is about 30 pages. There's no supplement, Ms. Giannetti? There's no supplement. Okay, and then the Commonwealth had about 25 pages and then the commonwealth supplement covered both motions and the commonwealth had originally probably hundreds of pages of exhibits so i have read all of that and i am mindful also i keep coming back to the letter that was written for me to me on february 26 from the deputy u.s attorney who says we expect of course that the parties will disclose orally the materials in court only as necessary to further the proceedings. So I've read everything. Um, I'm going to give each side 10 minutes and we're going to start with the motion to dismiss. Um, Ooh. Okay, that's the, well, let me wait. Let's get, I saw an article that's interesting, but let, let me let this play out. Um, and there was a federal investigation, Ms. Montes says, and to the investigators, that's all you need to know. I want to know what came of that investigation. So, Mr. Jackson, I'll hear you. I think it would be particularly helpful Ooh. if... Oak said they redid the basement and sold the house right after this? Wow. If you <laughs> were to focus on the exact prejudice to the defendant and how this all goes to the core of the Odell motion. And as you know, that's an awfully high bar. So go ahead. Your Honor, I, I will try to edit um, my comments to stay within t the 10 minute mark. It's very difficult to do that. I did not know that we were gonna be under such incredible time constraints. As a matter of fact, I thought that the court said the last time we were in court, we had basically your, your words. Yeah, that we all had day. All day. But that was when we had 
all the motions, but it's just these two motions right, today. But they're, but they're big. Uh, they're big. They're consist, uh, uh, so with why don't you go ahead and start? If you need additional time, tell me. But it would be important to focus your argument. Again, I'm mindful of what the U.S. Attorney said to me in that letter. And, and I am as well, and my that mindfulness suggests that the, my comments will be directed to that which is necessary to further the proceedings. Okay. Which cool. means that... Right ahead. I'll start with the, um, uh, the basic rule of Odell. Uh, we start with the postulate that any distortion of the evidence, that's where we start, any distortion of the evidence during the course of a grand jury proceeding impairs the integrity of the indictment, if there is an indictment, and pursuant to Odell, that requires dismissal. Um, in this particular case, there were myriad examples, which I will Again, I'll edit. I was going to go through several, but I'll just touch on them very quickly. Yeah, your memo, I have to say, your memo is very thorough and very helpful to me because you outline everything and same in your supplement. Thank you. Um, the first point I want to discuss is the, what we believe is the failure to disclose Sergeant Michael Lank's personal lifelong relationship with some of the individuals, specifically the individual Chris Albert. There was a, a comment or a, a, an incident, I should say, that we referred to in our moving papers that dealt with Chris Albert and Sergeant Lank years ago. They have a long-standing, years-long relationship. And I'll, I'll, I'll close this loop in just a second, but if you'll allow me, that relationship goes all the way back to 2002 at least. And there was an incident in which Sergeant Lank and Chris Albert had gotten into what can easily be described as a bar fight. Chris Albert had gotten into a bar fight of some sort. Michael Lank walks out of the, the same bar or an adjacent bar. He had been drinking with his buddy Chris. He walks out, stumbles out, announces to the, to the uh, participants in this fight that he was quote unquote deputizing himself and ultimately came to Chris Albert's aid. That was with the specific intent to assist an Albert in getting out of a legal jam, all the way back to 2002. The reason I bring that up, and by the way, both of the individuals involved, not Sergeant Lank, both of the other individuals involved were ultimately arrested by Sergeant Lank. That case went to trial, and both of the individuals were found not guilty of assault. And that's after Michael Lank engaged in fisticuffs with at least one of the men, to the degree that the Canton police officers had to pull him off of the individual. So this is, this is in your memo and it also is exhibits C through E attached That's right. to your memo. And the reason this comes to a head and the, the, the conflict of interest comes to a head is because Michael Lank ultimately was the first person to walk into Brian Albert's house. During the course of the grand jury, nobody elicited information from Michael Lank that he had a close personal relationship with the Alberts, that he had in years past come to the Alberts' aid. And yet he was the first person that came into the house. Even the grand jurors were stunned by this and asked, the specific grand jurors asked Michael Lank and asked the Commonwealth, or through the Commonwealth of the witness, why didn't Brian Albert ever even come out of the house? And I think we have the answer. And the answer is because the Albert, specifically Brian Albert, was waiting on a friendly. And they got that friendly through Michael Lank. That was withheld from the grand jury Sergeant Lank is a longtime childhood friend of the Alberts. The Canton Police Department was conflicted off the case because of those personal and familiar relationships that the Alberts have with Canton Police Department. And Sergeant Lank has a history of using his position as a police officer to shield the Alberts from criminal liability. That was never brought out. That's the kind of distortion that Odell talks about. Another broad example or a broad category that I want to discuss briefly deals with Trooper Michael Proctor. The Commonwealth held, withheld from the grand jury clear and even more egregious <clears throat> conflicts of interest as they pertain to Michael Proctor. Sergeant Lank was aware of this irremediable conflict that Canton Police Department had and that he should have had with the Alberts. So what does he do? He calls in Massachusetts State Police. And who do they send but Michael Proctor? And that's like jumping from the frying pan into the fire. That's the same Michael Proctor who's also years long close family friends with the Alberts. The Proctors have called the Alberts their quote second family. And to that point, now we have benefit of some hindsight. And that's the federal investigation. We have been saying since September 16th, 2022, 
in lengthy motions that we filed before this court and filed with the Commonwealth. There is a conflict. You're not investigating the conflict. That conflict was never described to the grand jurors. And we've been rebuffed at every single turn. Newly uncovered text messages but from the feds reveal that on January 19th, 2022, think about that date, that's 10 days before the incident. January 19th, 2022, Michael Proctor texted his own family members discussing the specifics of having Julie Albert babysit for his toddler child. We should all let that sink in for a second. So yeah, I understand that. There is a level of closeness that cannot be overstated. Michael Proctor is so connected to the Alberts that he was entrusting them or willing to entrust the Alberts to be caregivers for his toddler child. And it's not lost on anybody in this courtroom that for two years, the Commonwealth has been denying it and still denies it in their opposition paperwork. They still say, well, there's nothing to see here. It's Michael Proctor's sister who really is friends with Julie Albert, and that, you know, that's not a big deal. Everybody look the other way. As a matter of fact, Ms. McLaughlin wrote the following in her opposition. Trooper Proctor's supposed close and personal relationship with the Alberts is, quote, entirely unfounded and a desperate creation of the defense, a desperate creation of ours, which she says we created this. But now we have the benefit of the federal investigation. And the Commonwealth finds itself in that very unenviable position of having to eat some very distasteful words. Because we didn't create anything. And there's more. On February 1st, 2022, three days after John O'Keefe was killed, there was another text message. In this one, Michael Proctor's sister texts Michael Proctor very specifically and writes the following, quote, just saw Julie, and Julie said when all this is over, she wants to give you, Michael Proctor, a thank you gift. Michael Proctor didn't respond with, that's inappropriate, these are witnesses, these are potential suspects, uh, please tell her don't ever do that again, don't ever suggest an exchange of gifts again, that would be inappropriate, I'm going to go write a report, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Lally, and Mr. Lally's going to turn that information over to the defense and to the court, no. That's what he should have done. What he did do is he responded, get Elizabeth one, his wife. In other words, get the gift from my wife. It'll be a little less obvious. I thought I've seen somebody also have um, like a picture character map. I think that would be pretty useful. But it does look like a very kind of complicated case. I was looking at Sleuthy's timeline a little bit too. And there's a lot. There is a whole lot. <clears throat> a whole lot to go through. So I'll see if I can find us that little picture thing too. So now we have the lead investigator from Massachusetts State Police literally discussing the exchange of gifts between the Albert family on the one hand and the proctor. Blair says that's insane. The lead investigator had the owner of the Holmes family member babysit his children where Boston police officer John O'Keefe was murdered. That's crazy. Damn. Messy. She has the charts. What does she have on, on her uh, Twitter or like a website? Proctor family, on the other hand, as a thank you, their words for helping the Alberts out of a jam. And if you looked up quid pro quo in the dictionary, you would find this set of text messages. Two years later to the day on February 1st, 2024. Now let's fast forward two years later. Now Michael Proctor finds himself on the witness stand in front of a federal grand jury which we just found out about. That grand jury was tasked with a singular commission, and that was investigating crimes of public corruption by law enforcement in relation to this case. And during that testimony, he was confronted with these and, and myriad other examples of evidence of his close ties to the Albert family. And he admitted to an AUSA under very intense questioning that not only does he know the Alberts, and does he socialize with them, does he drink with them, does he go to pool parties with them, 
But he told his partner, Yuri Butnik, all of this before Yuri Butnik testified at the grand jury and before he and Butnik actually interviewed Chris Albert. Why does that mean something? Why does that mean something to the court and to this argument? Because when Yuri Butnik testified before the state court grand jury, he testified that, quote, following formal introductions, end quote, Julie Albert and Chris Albert provided their phone numbers. Following formal introductions. That was a clear deceit on the grand jurors. Yuri Butnik knew, as did Michael Proctor, they didn't need formal introductions. Michael Proctor was considering having Julie Albert babysit his kid 10 days ago. Actually, at that time, 13 days ago. That left to... I mean, <laughs> that just sounds crazy as hell. They didn't need formal introductions. Michael Proctor was considering having Julie Albert babysit his kid. 10 days ago, actually at that time, 13 days ago. That left the grand jury with the intentional false in, uh, impression that these people literally do not know each other. They've never been in contact. They're complete strangers. That was a lie. That was a concerted effort to hide that relationship and to hide the conflict of interest. And the grand jurors were fooled. They were left with the impression, Michael Prochner, Yuri Butnik, they don't know these folks. They're completely neutral, independent investigators, and nothing could be further from the truth. And the revelation of this evidence culminated in front of that same grand jury on February 1st, 1st, 2024. Under additional intense questioning by the assistant United States attorney, Proctor was caught in his own web of deceit and testified as follows, quote, so this is the AUSA talking or asking the question. So obviously we're asking questions about your relationship with Julie Albert, with Chris Albert and with Colin Albert. Do you understand that? Answer, yes, sir. Question. And you're saying that you're minimizing, quote, minimizing your relationship to the grand jury, correct? Answer, yes. He finally, under the scrutiny of Whoa. a federal grand jury, admitted that he had been lying about his relationship to the Alberts, which means he lied to the grand jury, which means the evidence was distorted in front of the grand jury. And okay. that is the burden that Odell requires. All right, so your time is up, which includes me interjecting. Do you want five more minutes? If I could, if I could yeah. employ the question. I'd, I'd like you to sort of get to the questions I asked as well. All right, I know you're recent. I mean, that's pretty tough, but just the 10 minutes allotted <laughs> to try to get through everything. Citing the evidence um, that I've read. But, so I'll, I'll give you five more minutes. Go Thank ahead. Thank you. I want to shift gears to a, uh, another example or another series of examples of evidence that was distorted before the grand jury. Um, and that deals with the use of, or the, the um, insinuation of Kevin Albert, yet another Albert at the behest of Michael Proctor. Kevin Albert is a sworn Canton police officer. On day one, the Canton police department was completely recused off the case in no small part because of Kevin Albert. And the fact that uh, uh, John O'Keefe's body no. was found on <laughs> BL told me, because I'm asking questions, she said you have a form on Discord with all the information about this case. Oh, God. <laughs> I don't know why I've never just... <clears throat> I, I've heard people talking about this. I've just never sat down. I don't even... I almost wonder if it's too late. I mean, you know, it's never too late, but I guess I'd have to sit and listen, find a video or, or something to listen to to try to catch up on it. Um... But it's a it's an interesting case. Uh, I'll say, like Glare said, people are very passionate. I saw a lot of stuff going on um, online and, and the community and everything. Kevin Albert's brother's law. Check out the page. Yet the evidence that has been disclosed by the federal investigation, which we had no, pri we were not privy to, um, is that Michael Proctor actually, actually utilized Kevin Albert's services to coordinate with the very witnesses who should have been potentially suspects and certainly should not have been subject to coordination by an Albert. When that's the very person on whose lawn uh, John O'Keefe or his oh, brother's lawn, chart, John O'Keefe was found. I want to turn to at least one more, in, uh, one more situation okay. uh, in my remaining minute or so, uh, given the fact that this is curtailed. And this is not in our, our papers, but obviously 
it's a complete and probably the most obvious distortion of the facts. The Commonwealth suppressed one of the most obvious pieces of exculpatory evidence in the entire case, and that was a piece of evidence that they know torpedoes their entire case and their theory of this case, and that's Jennifer McCabe's Google search at 2.27 a.m., how long to die in cold. They had the, her phone at the time of the grand jury. They had her complete extraction of that phone at the time of the grand jury. They had a Celebrite report, Your Honor, at the time of the grand jury, and yet they did not present this evidence. They claim, oh, well, we didn't have the right version of the Celebrite uh, software. That's on them. That's not our fault, certainly not Ms. Reed's fault. That's their fault. Get the right software. If you're going to bring this case, do it the right way. They say their, their argument is, well, we just didn't have the right software, so we didn't have the information. That's not true. They did have the information. It was sitting in her phone. They just didn't do their job in extracting. And should the Commonwealth once again stand up in some sort of def desperate pitch to dispute that time and this critical evidence, the court should note the following. Not only does the Celebrite report confirm the search and the time of that search, not only do our experts confirm the search and the time of that search, but now a Quantico-trained special agent with the FBI's Regional Computer Forensic Lab. In other words, the United States Federal Bureau of Investigation also specifically confirms that that search was made on Jennifer McCabe's phone and it was made on or before 2.27 and 40 seconds a.m. on January 29th, 2022. That fact, Your Honor, is no longer open for debate. And none of that was presented before the grand jury. I'll conclude by saying any one of these examples, and I didn't touch on all of them, but any one of these examples, the gift giving, uh, the babysitting, uh, the, the telephone extraction, the Google search at 2.27 in the morning, all of these, any one of these would be enough to dismiss the charges as they sit here today. But the cumulative effect of this deception and all of it, this distortion in front of the grand jury, is too much for the court to ignore. The simple fact, Your Honor, is the presentation before the, uh, by the Commonwealth before the grand jury in the state court action, it just wasn't fair. That's the easiest way to say it. It just didn't give Ms. Reed a fair shot. It just didn't. That presentation was, pa was packed with lies, known lies by the investigators, and the omissions and the manipulations and deceit by the very people that are supposed to be the ones that we in the community can trust. The ones that we're, are supposed to protect our interests and the law does not allow this sort of conduct to go unchecked. When the, the remedy when this sort of travesty of justice occurs is established by the, this state's Supreme Judicial Court and that is dismissal of the indictment in its entirety. And it is not enough, and I'll be surprised if I don't hear it today, but something suggests, based on the, the moving papers that we just got from Mr. McLaughlin and Mr. Mc, uh, Mr. Lally, are, well, Your Honor, we, we didn't know. We didn't know about the text messages. We didn't know about Proctor. We didn't know about Lank. All that stuff was revealed through the federal grand jury. It doesn't matter that Ms. McLaughlin individually didn't know, or Mr. Lally can say, I, I claim ignorance. I didn't know either. It's enough that, the, that an arm of their institution, law enforcement, they knew, and that was their job to tell the truth. That was their job not to fool or distort the Commonwealth. I'm sorry, the, uh, the grand jurors. And with that, Your Honor, thank you for the time, and I'll submit. All right, thank you. Mr. Lally, we're gonna start with 10 minutes. If you need more, you need to tell me. Sure. And thank you, Your Honor. No, I, I think 10 minutes should be fine. I just, uh, I know the mm. court. We'll see Karen smiling. Was, uh, taken uh, painstaking uh, detail to go through all the, the material that's submitted, so I'll, I'll be as brief as I can. Um, Ooh, look at the look essentially, the defendant, as, as the court is aware, <clears throat> doesn't challenge uh, the grand jury presentation on the McCarthy grounds or a probable cause standard. Defendant motions challenges under Odell. Uh, Odell essentially states dismissal of an indictment on impairment of the grand jury proceedings requires proof of three elements, as the court is well aware. Uh, one, that the Commonwealth knowingly or recklessly presented false or deceptive evidence to the grand jury. Uh, secondly, that the evidence was presented for the purpose of obtaining an indictment. And three, that the evidence probably influenced the grand jury's decision to indict. 
none of which uh, I would submit uh, the defendant has uh, met their burden uh, with reference to any of those three elements. Just addressing uh, sort of the overarching uh, themes of, of the defendant's motion, uh, the defendant challenges, uh, as you just stated, the testimony of uh, Canton Police Sergeant Lank and his testimony attributing statements to the defendant that were made in the aftermath of Mr. O'Keefe's body being discovered in a purported deception of Sergeant Lank's uh, relationship with the Albert family. Uh, Trooper Proctor's uh, purported false and deceptive statements uh, throughout the course of his testimony and the Commonwealth's failure to uh, elicit a purported inconsistent statement of Christopher Albert and the Commonwealth's failure to impeach uh, Julie Albert's testimony. Your Honor, simply put, none of these uh, issues or, or stated malfeasance uh, actually uh, occurred before this grand jury. As it relates uh, to uh, Sergeant Lank, I mean, we're talking about uh, what, what the defendant submits as an attachment is an incident from uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, which doesn't involve anyone who was at the house at uh, 34 Fairview <coughs> Road on the night uh, when Mr. O'Keefe died. Um, the statements that uh, Sergeant Lank uh, is attributing to the defendant were not only testified to uh, by Sergeant Lank, as, and they're testified not in a deceptive manner, they're testified to by Sergeant Lank in the sense that he indicated he spoke to officers who had preceded his arrival. All of those officers also testified before the grand jury. Um, all of those members who uh, received statements from the defendant uh, is essentially indicating that she did it. That doesn't just come from one source. That comes from at least five different witnesses, three of them paramedics with the Canton Fire Department. Counsel posits the question of why didn't Brian Albert come out of the house? No one did. Not only out of that house, but any house. It's clearly visible in the grand jury exhibits. You have the cruiser camera footage from Officer Seraf, uh, as far as no one else in the neighborhood coming out of the house, as well as testimony from a number of different witnesses uh, that were there and present on that morning in the dark, in a blizzard at the time that Mr. O'Keefe is found. Counsel wants to say that the Commonwealth is asking the court or everybody to sort of look the other way when it comes to these things. What I would submit is that's exactly what the defendant is doing. Look the other way, defense by obfuscation. It's essentially, it's a, it's a three card money trick, uh, you know, card trick uh, on the corner on the side. Look at all of this, look at uh, this relationship, look at that relationship, conflating these relationships, sort of the distortion that I would say between what exists in social media realm and what exists in reality. That if you know someone, that automatically means that you're best friends with them, every single one of their siblings, every single person that they've ever met or socialized with. I mean, babysitting is kind of a big deal. I don't know. Well, for maybe for some, maybe not others, but uh, yeah. Uh, one social interaction, you know, transforms into a long-standing 20-year relationship, all of those things. And what the defense is obfuscating from is the overwhelming evidence that was presented to this grand jury from a multitude of sources, 42 separate witnesses, 56 exhibits, over 1,400 pages of transcript, which clearly demonstrate and indicate that the defendant, Karen Reed, killed John O'Keefe. But they don't want you to look at that. They want you to look at who texted who when and what they said and what was asked and what was promised. The in reviewing the materials uh, provided by the U.S. Attorney's Office, a couple things that I would note is, number one, um, they have no idea how much of a percentage of the totality of the federal materials we have. I don't know if we have 5 percent, 50 percent, 90 percent. I have no idea. The other part that's confounding is that it appears that these uh, materials or materials from the state prosecution were provided to the U.S. Attorney's Office by Mr. Yanetti or by the defendant or by defense counsel. And again, what I don't know is how much of a percentage of the total discovery from the state case was actually given and provided uh, to uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office in which to conduct their investigation. But it's clear from the investigation that they extensively investigated the facts and circumstances that led to Mr. O'Keefe's death. In sum, what I would submit, just as Ms. McLaughlin stated on the last date, these materials are largely consistent with the Commonwealth theory of the case. There is no suggestion of a third party culprit, no suggestion of cover up of evidence, no suggestion uh, from the 13 civilians uh, witnesses testimony that we've received uh, or transcripts of that testimony. 
All of them confirmed that Mr. O'Keefe never entered 34 Fairview Road. All of it uh, was absolutely no animosity between the individuals at the Waterfall Bar or at 34 Fairview residents. There was no fight. There was no dog attack. There was no eyewitness to the circumstance. And that's what somebody had said to about this dog attack. I saw somebody mentioning in the chat earlier. Um, and I, I guess this dog attack would have happened at the homeowner's house of the party where it took place. He's saying it's not. I wonder. Yeah, what does the evidence show? I guess that's what they're saying. You're gonna have to have to look at the documentation, documents, or whatever. There's a lot of posts in that my own Discord that I haven't ever seen before. That's in this group. Circumstances led to Mr. O'Keefe's death. Witnesses also testified consistent. A year later, they testified in the state grand jury in the spring of 2022, largely in the spring of 2022, and then largely in the spring of 2023 before the federal grand jury. And their testimonies are largely consistent with the defendants uh, making declarative statements that she did it. Uh, not a question mark at the end, but clear uh, definitive statements on scene that she had discussed uh, the damage to her taillight prior to leaving Mr. O'Keefe's home on the morning of January 29th. You have a number of different uh, statements that were alluded to uh, by Mr. Jackson in regard to uh, text between, uh, tr from Trooper Proctor's phone. Of note, there are no text messages between Trooper Proctor's phone and Julie Albert's phone, except for two no content text messages, one from June 21st, 2020, and one from September 1st of 2020. There is a discussion between Trooper Proctor and his sister because Julie Albert had uh, provided childcare in a pinch uh, on several occasions for Trooper Proctor's sister. Trooper Proctor also testified that Julie Albert never did that for him, never watched his kids, never uh, had looked after his children. Uh, that essentially never happened. Lastly, <clears throat> get to the, uh, the Google search, and I would agree with counsel in the sense that it's really no longer open for debate. But I'm not really sure why we're still even talking about this or why this is still a topic uh, that they're pushing. Essentially, what we have is, <clears throat> yes, what counsel mentions is there is one expert who was given two extractions, presumably provided by defense counsel, uh, that indicates uh, from that particular FBI expert uh, that the searches were done at two something in the morning. What counsel neglects to sort of raise and, and stress with the court is that there's a separate, uh, and I forget exactly what it stands for, but an RCFL uh, uh, analysis of the phone in which through both Axiom and through Celebrite, uh, and that conclusion of that expert is that the searches occurred when Ms. McCabe testified they occurred because the defendant asked her to conduct those searches at 6.23 and 6.24 in the morning. Really, the argument stops at the point of it's not, we didn't do our job to get a cell. The cell right version that shows that information did not exist at the time of the grand jury. So I'm, I'm not really sure how the Commonwealth is supposed to run something through a cell right version that isn't in existence at the time the grand jury is conducted. It's a subsequent version in which their expert, Mr. Green, finds these uh, purported uh, search without looking at the cache files, without looking at the DB list, without looking at the SQLite database, without looking at the wall file, all of which was done not only by Trooper Garino, an independent expert named Jessica Hyde, which counsel has all of that, as well as the senior technical uh, uh, analyst from cell by itself, a man named Mr. Whiffen. Counsel's had this report for months at this point. And essentially, Mr. Whiffen uh, is essentially the person who creates the software that all of these experts are using. And his definitive opinion indicated in his report is that Ms. McCabe conducted those searches at 6.23 and 6.24 in the morning. So I would agree with counsel uh, that it's really no longer up for debate. Uh, I think we just disagree as to uh, the conclusions of that. But based on the totality of the evidence uh, and what I would submit as the overwhelming evidence that was presented uh, to this grand jury, uh, all of these sort of individual uh, parsing of, of stated malfeasance simply doesn't even come close uh, to sustaining the burden under Odell. And for that reason, I would ask that the court deny the motion to dismiss. Okay. Do you want a few minutes, Mr. Jackson, to respond? Very briefly. Okay. Um, first of all, it, it's always interesting to 
hear an argument that suggests there's, there's nothing to see here. And that's exactly what Mr. Lally did yet again. He said, look the other way, look the other way. Oh, it's the defense that wants you to look the other way. <laughs> we don't want you to look the other way, Your Honor. We want you to look directly at the evidence of the compromised relationships. Mm. So I was kind of like <clears throat> wondering, like, okay, I keep hearing this McCabe, McCabe, Jennifer McCabe. Who the hell is Jennifer McCabe? Because I'm like lost trying to find my bearing. And I think that was somebody, and I'm sure there's people in the chat that can tell me, was she at the party? She attended the party? The lawyer for a witness against a local woman charged in the death of her Boston officer, a police officer boyfriend, is firing back at defense claims about her involvement in the case. High profile Brockton lawyer Kevin Reddington, who represents Jennifer McCabe, told the Sun Chronicle Tuesday that his client is being smeared by lawyers for Karen Reed. Um, she's charged with second degree murder. The boyfriend, John, uh, John O'Keefe, on the night of January 28, 2022, Reed allegedly backed her SUV outside a Canton home and left him for dead in a snowstorm, allegedly. She's pled not guilty. In the court filings, her lawyers, her lawyers cast blame on others, including McCabe, who were attending an after party at the Canton home of Boston Police Officer Brian Albert after a night of bar hopping. McCabe, the defense claims, participated in a cover-up so O'Keefe's death could be pinned on Reed. Now, here's the interesting shit. The defense lawyers say a forensic search of McCabe's phone revealed a Google search for the phrase how long to die in the cold hours before O'Keefe was found in the snow outside the house. What? But Reddington to the defense's team's claims are baseless and that his client is bearing the brunt of the wild speculation surrounding the case. She's a very caring person. She cooperated with the police. She answered all their questions. She testified before grand jury. Next thing you know, she's getting smeared by the defense team. Um, shouldn't they just have that evidence then? Can't they... FBI confirmed it? That's wild. Glare says Jennifer McCabe is the person who the person the victim was communicating with just before the party. She was John's direct contact. Wow. No one has denied the existence of the 623 AM and 624 AM. How long to die in the cold? Google search by Jennifer. Many have denied the existence of the 227 AM. How long to die in the cold? Google search by Jennifer. All three exist according to the federal agent from the FBI's Regional Computer Forensic Lab, RCFL. That's the reference, RCFL. She Googled how long to die in the cold while John O'Keefe was dying in the cold on the lawn of a house just as she lived. That, bro. Damn. <laughs> and that, I, I, that's just like a little snippet of the story that I'm getting. Holy moly. Trooper Proctor had and hid. That's what we want the court to look at. He suggests, oh, well, there's just a couple of text messages. It's no big deal. It's couple. The, the fact is, Your Honor, uh, it, she really hit him. She really hit him with the car. Let's remember, she really hit him. And these text messages, they mean nothing. We're talking about the integrity of a, of a, a, a sitting grand jury and the presentation before that grand jury. What Mr. Lally now has in his possession, but he didn't mention, now that he says, oh, well, she, she killed him. Let's just get on with it. She killed him. He's already tried and convicted her in his mind and tried to do it in this courtroom. It doesn't quite work that way. Now Mr. Lally has in his possession another thing from the feds that we didn't have access to. The federal investigators hired, independent of us, we had no idea, and independent of the Commonwealth, hired a professional reconstructionist, three PhDs, to look into exactly this, this issue. Did Karen Reed's car, did her SUV, make contact with John O'Keefe. And their conclusion to a person was his injuries were inconsistent with the damage on the car. The, in, the damage on the car was inconsistent with having, been made, having made contact with John O'Keefe's body. In other words, the car didn't hit him and he wasn't hit by the car, period, full stop. That's their <laughs> independent expert, not ours, not somebody on our payroll, like Mr. Whiffen, 
or one of their experts, or Trooper Guarino, who's an arm of the agency. This is an independent federal government witness, or series of witnesses, who say unequivocally, that car did not hit John O'Keefe, and John O'Keefe was not hit by that car. But he didn't mention that. Second, he argued that the, the texts were not, you know, these aren't texts between Julie Proctor, I'm sorry, Julie Albert and Michael Proctor. These are texts between his family members. And in, then he mentions these two texts that had no content. What are the chances that Michael Proctor sent Julie Albert texts with no content? Your Honor, it's not that they didn't have content, it's that it couldn't be recovered, which sometimes happens. But we do have evidence that they were, in fact, in communication with each other as early as 2020. And with regard to the 2.27 a.m. search, um, it's not a three-card Monty. It's not a shell game or whatever other fanciful thing Mr. Lally wants to suggest that it is, as he tap dances his way around this. He says that our expert, Rick Green, didn't look at the SQ Light database. Yeah, Mr. Lally, reread re his report. Yes, he did. He didn't look at the wall file. Yeah, Mr. Lally, reread his report. Yes, he in fact did. And he's the one that found the 2.27 a.m. search. And with regard to the regional computer forensics lab, that's the definition he couldn't remember, what they actually said was, because Mr. Lally got this wrong too, what they actually said was yes, there was a 623 and a 624 search. And there was a 227 AM search as well. All three of those searches existed in the phone, Julie McCabe's, uh, Jennifer McCabe's phone, and it's not up for debate. That wasn't presented to the grand jury. The information that we've been talking about today wasn't presented to the grand jury. We're talking about the integrity of a proceeding. He doesn't get to convict my client by standing up here and pounding the fist, uh, pounding the table and saying, oh, she did it, she hit him. So let's just all get on with it and deny this motion. We're talking about the integrity of what is the foundation of Massachusetts judicial system. And that integrity was comp uh, compromised, that integrity was impaired. And it demands that justice be done. And that justice is in the hands of this court. We ask this court to do what the, the evidence dictates do what the law dictates, and that is dismiss this indictment. That is the only way justice will be found in this case. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Yannetti, are you all set? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. So at the, the same time, and uh, let's see how you do with it. We believe our witnesses. They are telling the truth. Karen Reed is guilty. Any suggestion to the contrary is a desperate attempt to reassign guilt. Can you imagine a district attorney with a sworn duty to do justice and respect the presumption of innocence issuing such a statement in a pending case? Before August 25th of 2023, I could not. Yet that was the message of Norfolk County District Attorney Michael Morrissey to potential jurors in this case on that date. I've been practicing criminal law as both a prosecutor and a defense attorney for over 30 years now. Never have I seen such unethical conduct from a prosecutor. I know of at least one law professor who used Mr. Morrissey's statement in his class to teach his law students how a prosecutor should not act. Another member of the bar has already reported Mr. Morrissey's conduct to the BBO. And now we are here with a motion to disqualify Mr. Morrissey from further prosecuting this case because he has a personal interest in the outcome. Your Honor, this court should grant our motion to disqualify. And at the outset, I note that we've also moved for sanctions, dismissal of these indictments as a result of his misconduct. But we have so many additional grounds for dismissal as a result of the material provided to both sides by the federal authorities that we will be filing a further motion to dismiss for extraordinary governmental misconduct. My co-counsel has spoken to that previously. To the extent that the court entertains our motion for sanctions, specifically dismissal, as a result of his so egregious- can, can I just interrupt there and ask you, are these going to be the same motion, essentially? No. Uh, there's uh, information and evidence that's been provided by the federal authorities 
which deals with the egregious conduct of both the district attorney and his investigators and the police. That will be the subject of a uh, separate motion, Your Honor. So I thought that was going to be your supplemental memo to this motion. It sounds like it's the same issue, Mr. No, Kennedy. it's it's not. And I'm uh, what I'm uh, saying to the court is I want I have limited time. I, I, I when I interrupt you, I, I stop the time. Well, I, so. I appreciate that. But even even with that, Your Honor, my the focus of my argument is going to be is going to be on the disqualification as opposed to the dismissal. I've submitted papers on the dismissal. I will rest on those papers with regard to that issue. That's my only point. All um, right, so when you file the other motion, I need you to include in your memo how that's different specifically from understood. this. Not just the remedy, but how the basis understood. of it is different. Understood. All right, so I'm going to start you again from scratch. Go right ahead. I appreciate it. Well, Your Honor, this case uh, admittedly has been an unusual one for a district attorney to deal with. The district attorney's office is not accustomed to a criminal defendant fighting back in the way we have prior to trial. What usually happens when the prosecution brings charges is they detail the allegations at an arraignment in court, and as a result of their narrative, as a result, their narrative and theory of the case becomes widely reported, while the defendant and the defense team remain relatively quiet. After arraignment, moreover, the media typically lose interest and wait until a trial or potential resolution of the case before they start reporting on the case again. And in this way, the district attorney's office is quite accustomed to always controlling the narrative in pending cases, at least until the defense makes an opening statement at trial. And as long as the prosecution gets to control the narrative in the press, they have no problem with what's being reported. But of course, this case has been different. Their control of the narrative did not last very long here. In our view, it became clear very early on in this case that their narrative was wrong. Their theory of the case was wrong. Their allegations did not fit with the evidence that we fought so hard and for so long to get access to over two long years. So along the way, we spoke out about our findings of exculpatory evidence, mostly within this courtroom, but occasionally outside. The DA was not used to that and apparently didn't like it because they initially sought the extraordinary remedy from this court of trying to gag the defense from exercising our First Amendment rights to discuss a client who at all times is presumed to be innocent. And as you know, they filed that motion on June 9th of 2023, and it didn't work. The court denied the motion, specifically ruling that any statements attributed to counsel could generally be characterized as responses to the accusations against Ms. Reed and are therefore permitted under the rules. When you made that ruling, though, Your Honor, you admonished both sides that commenting on the credibility of witnesses would have a prejudicial effect on the proceeding. And at that point, we largely stopped making extrajudicial statements. By contrast, Norfolk County District Attorney Michael Morrissey only 25 days after that court's ruling, instead decided, decided to blatantly ignore this court's admonishment. D.A. Morrissey went off the rails, gave an unprecedented video statement to the media where he specifically vouched for the credibility of Commonwealth witnesses in violation of the rules of professional responsibility, in violation of this court's order. A member of the public issued a public records request and we got this to show all of the media outlets that D.A. Morrissey made sure received his statement. Before any trial has occurred, he called the defense theory in this case, quote, a false narrative. Before any trial has occurred, he announced his opinion that nobody within the home at 34 Fairview participated in any murder or any cover up. Before any trial, he vouched for the credibility of Commonwealth witnesses Jennifer McCabe, Matthew McCabe, and Brian Albert. He announced that those witnesses were forthcoming. In other words, truthful. Before any trial has occurred, D.A. Morrissey announced that the defense theory is, quote, a desperate attempt to reassign guilt, end quote. Given those broad statements of Mr. Morrissey's opinion that Karen Reed is guilty, can you believe that the DA and their opposition to this motion had the audacity to claim that DA Morrissey's words were narrowly tailored to the harassment of witnesses? 
it goes without saying, but your words are not narrowly tailored if you're a prosecutor vouching for the credibility of witnesses, particularly after a judge told you not to do that. Your words are not narrowly tailored if you're announcing to the public that you've already assigned guilt to a criminal defendant before trial. Mm. A desperate attempt to reassign guilt. DA Morrissey announced every potential juror in Norfolk County not that someone charged with a crime is innocent until proven guilty. The words innocent until proven guilty never came out of his mouth. Instead, he announced his office had already assigned guilt to Karen Reed. So in his view, when she fought back by re reasserting her right to be presumed innocent. He deemed that a desperate attempt to reassign guilt. Never in over 30 years of practice have I ever witnessed an elected DA so blatantly violate the rules of professional responsibility. Never have I witnessed an elected DA trample on the constitutional rights of a criminal defendant who enjoys the presumption of innocence. And I do have some perspective in this area. I had the privilege of spending the first 10 years of my career as an assistant district attorney in Middlesex County. I had the privilege of working with and for some of the finest DAs this Commonwealth has ever seen, from Scott Harshbarger to my mentor, Tom Riley, to Martha Coakley, Jerry Leone, Marion Ryan. In addition, I worked with some of the finest Massachusetts state troopers acting as homicide investigators, men and women I respect for their integrity and prowess as ethical investigators. In a million years, I could not imagine any of my former colleagues and bosses making such a statement. They were professionals with ethics and a humble respect Essex. for the awesome power they possessed Essex. as public prosecutors. So for those reasons, in some ways, it, it pains me to have to file a motion like this. But D.A. Morrissey, through his poor and unethical decision making, to release a video statement designed to prejudice potential jurors against my client, has forced my hand. So the question then becomes, why did he do this? Why did he take such a personal interest in this case such that he would take the unprecedented, and that's his word, unprecedented, step of vouching for Commonwealth witnesses? Why would he take the unprecedented step of denigrating the defense theory to potential jurors? The unprecedented step of announcing to the public that Karen Reed is guilty? Why would he trample over the presumption of innocence and announce that we're trying to reassign the guilt that he's already assigned to her? Well, on December 4th of 2023, we began to learn why. That was when the DA released uh, to us correspondence he had had with the U.S. Attorney's Office, which dated back to May of 2023. That correspondence revealed that federal authorities were investigating this case. And it's worth noting, they only released those to us once Fox 25 had succeeded in a public records request, and they knew what they had kept hidden was going to be reve revealed. And once we got those letters, we learned why they wanted them hit. We learned that in May of 2023, the DA's office knew there was a federal investigation. They did not reveal that knowledge to the defense. In fact, on June 12th of 2023, the acting U.S. attorney specifically told the DA's office they could reveal the existence of this federal investigation to us, but they didn't. They kept it mm. secret. And then worse, Your Honor, on December 4th of 2023, the district attorney's office provided a false notice of discovery to this court and to the defense. In that notice of discovery, they claimed they had received no confirmation that any witnesses had testified before a federal grand jury. We now know that was a lie. We know it's a lie because seven months earlier, D.A. Morrissey wrote that multiple state witnesses had received subpoenas. We know that was a lie because now that we've got the information from the feds, Nicole Albert testified before a federal grand jury that she participated in a group conference call with Jennifer McCabe, Matt McCabe, Brian Albert, ADA Lally, and victim witness advocate Stephen Nelson, a group conference call before she testified before the federal grand jury in July of 2023. We also know it was a lie because he wrote in his letter, and I quote, we have confirmed that witnesses testified before the federal grand jury. Yet seven months later, the DA's office tells this court that it had received no confirmation. That is outrageous. Mm. We are outraged that he lied to us. This court should be outraged that DA Morrissey lied to you. In a prior hearing in this case, sure, I argued okay. to this court that the letters back and forth confirmed that D.A. Morrissey believed that he personally 
and his office in general was being targeted by the U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, I chose my words carefully. I never said he received a target letter. The existence of a target letter is irrelevant. The inquiry is what does the DA know and believe? And he revealed in those letters what he knew and believed. He revealed that he believed that U.S. Attorney Rachel Rollins had a personal animus against him. He wrote, quote, she's made no secret of her personal animosity towards me. He also wrote that the head of the public corruption unit at the U.S. Attorney's Office may be personally retaliating against him and targeting him because his wife was unhappy with the way the Norfolk DA treated her. He wrote, in short, that he knew, felt, and believed that he and his office were being targeted. Now, why is that important? It's important because of the immense power that a prosecutor has. It is important because we need an unbiased prosecutor with no vested interest in the case to try to administer justice based on the evidence and not based on any personal interest in a case. It is important because in the words of U.S. Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson, quote, we must have assurance that those who wield this power will be guided solely by public responsibility. So I just want to tell you, you've gone over your time. I see you're reading, so you have some idea on how much longer you have. How much longer do you have with that? Probably about three minutes, Judge. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, indeed, Your Honor, Justice Jackson practically spoke to D.A. Morrissey from the grave. The prosecutor has more control over life, liberty, and reputation than any other person in America. His discretion is tremendous. He can have citizens investigated, and if he is that kind of person, he can have this done to the tune of public statements and veiled or unveiled intimations. Or the prosecutor may choose a subtle, more subtle course and simply have citizens' friends interviewed. The prosecutor can order arrests, present cases to a grand jury in a secret session, and on the basis of his one-sided presentation of facts can cause the citizen to be indicted and held for trial. Well, while the prosecutor at his best is one of the most beneficial forces in our society, when he acts with malice or other base motives, he's one of the worst. In his own words, D.A. Morrissey revealed he has an interest in this case that goes beyond the interests of justice. He revealed that he knew that his office was being unfairly targeted and investigated. And it doesn't matter if his belief or knowledge was right or wrong, it's only important that he believes it. And this means he has a personal interest in getting Karen Reed convicted. If he can use whatever means he has at his disposal to convict her and he succeeds, that would vindicate him and harm the federal investigation of his office. On the other hand, if she's found not guilty, as we expect she will be, he knows that he and his office will remain in the crosshairs of the federal investigation. And it's important to note, Your Honor, both sides have been made aware multiple times that as uh, we have this hearing today, that federal investigation is still open. Ooh. They've called most of the Commonwealth's witnesses to testify, but they're, they're not done. D.A. Morrissey has an interest in this case not to do justice, but to win. That's why he hid his knowledge of the federal investigation for seven months. That's why he slow walked discovery. That's why he gave a lengthy video statement saying Karen Reed is guilty. That's why he talked about our theory being a desperate attempt to reassign guilt. And perhaps that's why, in contravention of Judge Krupp's pre uh, preservation order, D.A. Morrissey's office gave the go-ahead to Brian Albert and Brian Higgins to destroy or dispose of their phones. We only learned that because the federal authorities revealed that in their investigation. And I'm just about ready to end. The DA also, as my colleague has uh, indicated, I'm sorry, the, the FBI has confirmed that Jennifer McCabe Googled, uh, you know, how long to die in the cold at 2.27 in the morning. Um, but what has not yet been mentioned is that five minutes before that, Brian Higgins and Brian Albert were calling each other at 2.22 in the morning on January 29th after previously testifying. They were both asleep at that time. There was a lot of suspicious activity in the early morning hours of January involving the witnesses that Morrissey improperly announced to the public were telling the truth. Mm. We're getting to the bottom of it, and the truth will come out. But as we continue to defend her, Your Honor, like any criminal defendant, my client deserves a neutral, impartial prosecutor interested solely in justice with no vested outcome in this case. And it's crystal clear we do not have that in Michael Morrissey. That is why he should be disqualified from this case, and that is why I urge you to do just that in the interest of impartial justice. All right.
Thank you very much. Who's arguing this? You, Mr. Lally? Yes. All right, so let's start with 10 if you need more. Trial is going to be interesting. All these people have to Thank testify. You, and, and again, I, I don't think I'm going to need uh, much more than that. Um, Why not? Again, I, I know the court has reviewed all the materials, and I look, know the court is well aware of the standard, and it's a standard uh, which I would submit uh, just simply hasn't been met here. Uh, to characterize um, counsel's actions uh, in this particular proceeding uh, with uh, specific reference to the media and saying it's, it's different, I, I think is, is minimization to the highest degree. Um, essentially, what the defendant is, is positing or what counsel is positing in this uh, motion is that due to a, a recorded statement by the district attorney uh, over six months ago uh, that that impinges uh, on her right to a fair trial or it impinges, uh, you know, shows some sort of deleterious motive on behalf of the district attorney in the handling of this case. The statement, as uh, the district attorney indicated in it, uh, was in response to an extraordinary degree of relentless uh, and, and really relentless harassment and intimidation of nearly every witness uh, associated with this case, which included a July 22nd rolling rally of nearly 100 people traveling to witnesses' homes and calling them murderers. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Did that happen? Man, it must be intense, man. I'm just thinking of like the trial. I, I, by the way, I, and I don't want to talk too, too too much because I didn't realize. I thought this was one hour. This hearing, it's actually. Oh, it actually is. <laughs> why? Do, I don't know why it feels like I thought we were here like two hours. How long we've been here? Oh no, so we're fine. We're we're on schedule because at five o'clock we're gonna check out the rust hearing. But yeah, I don't think this is gonna get dismissed. Just because I don't know. I don't think the judge is gonna do it. Um, this is going to be a really interesting trial, just seeing the bits and pieces now and just thinking of when these witnesses, cops and people at the party and whoever have to take the stand. Oh, man, just to see them be cross examined and the evidence that's going to come out. Th this, uh, I really don't know what way. The jury would swing. That is, is largely what uh, this was in response to and is in complete conformity with Massachusetts Rules of Professional Conduct 3.6b6 that permits an attorney to make a warning of danger concerning the behavior of a person involved when there is reason to believe that there exists a likelihood of substantial harm to an individual or to the public interest. It's also in conformity with Rule of Professional Conduct 3.6c. Uh, which allows for such statements to rebut the prejudicial effects of the defendant's and her counsel's misconduct. Uh, now, again, I know the court has, has read through uh, the Commonwealth's opposition, uh, but just to uh, highlight a few of those particular incidents. So, yes, um, the July 31st, I believe, was the ruling uh, in regard to the, uh, for lack of a better term, a, a gag order. Um, and I, I think it's been somewhat inappropriately or, or just patently falsely represented uh, uh, to this court in, in, in public what that, what that ruling said. It indicated um, <clears throat> that the statements uh, of counsel arguably crossed cross the line of uh, permissibility under Rule 3.6, and that meaning defense counsel. Uh, that the inflammatory statements uh, about the Commonwealth and witnesses, particularly by Attorney Jackson, appear to have fueled much of the publicity in this case. And that's a quote from the court's ruling. And that the C defense counsel did not have carte blanche to speak with the media. And going forward, defense counsel should ensure that their statements are limited in conformity with the rules. And it denied uh, the Commonwealth's request for that gag order at this time. Um, denying it without prejudice. And then Mr. Giannetti wants to get up here and say that they largely stopped making extrajudicial statements after the court's ruling. And so I guess largely stopping would then include August 22nd, the day before the district attorney's uh, statement, a uh, ABC News broadcast in which Mr. Giannetti and Mr. Jackson uh, were, were featured uh, for a nine minute, 37 second segment 
in which Attorney Jackson uh, indicated that pieces of taillight were planted after the fact that the victim walked into the house, I think he was confronted, was likely brought down to the basement. I think the confrontation got physical and he was beaten, beaten to a point of unconsciousness, uh, that he had defensive wounds, uh, bruises on the back of his hands, largely of which uh, is all not only not true, uh, but directly contradictory to the uh, vast amount of evidence uh, that has been turned over in this case. Mr. Jackson then went on to continue that this was a cover-up and indicating that John was murdered inside that house, his body was placed outside. <clears throat> this also continued into September. Uh, September 17th, the defendant traveling with Attorney Jackson, Attorney Little, and a woman believed to be a television news producer to the victim's home, to Mr. O'Keefe's home, in direct violation of her conditions of release where she has a stay away from, uh, as well as other places of interest and sort of tour uh, around the town of Canton. When balancing the amount of public and prejudicial statements made by the defendant and her counsel, the Commonwealth would suggest that then characterizing the district attorney's statement from over six months ago, threatening her right to a fair trial, is simply a position that's just untenable. Now, in context, as far as those particular statements, uh, those particular actions go, um, as the court is well aware, um, there is a significant history uh, between this defendant, Mr. Unetti, Mr. Jackson, and the social media blogger, Mr. Kearney, who's now been indicted for intimidation of witnesses in this case. Um, and with reference uh, to that, there is a significant, despite public uh, indications to the contrary uh, that indications from Mr. Kearney's phone, uh, which was seized, is that there is a precipitous amount of phone communications, indications of uh, communications between Mr. Kearney and Ms. Reed on a signal messaging app, uh, an encrypted app, as well as I believe about 189 phone calls over a span of a few months. And that's just what's indicated or contained in the phone. There is also, going back to the spring of 23, direct communications between Mr. Kearney and Mr. Yannetti and Mr. Kearney and Mr. Jack. So when they're saying Mr. Kearney, they're, they're talking about Turtable, I think. Direct phone call. Indications that there is that, with reference uh, to that, there is a significant, despite public uh, indications to the contrary, uh, that Indications from Mr. Kearney's phone, uh, which was seized, is that there is a precipitous amount of phone communications, indications of uh, communications between Mr. Kearney and Ms. Reed on a signal messaging app, uh, an encrypted oh, app, as well man. as, I believe, about 189 phone calls over a span of a few months. Wow, so yeah, they've been, I mean, I'd say he's probably... I don't know if biggest supporter is the right word, but he's he's definitely taken... Um, I don't know, the lead in the charge of the whole, you know, free Karen Reed that she's innocent. So I, I guess, I guess, I guess when he got arrested, they, I guess they seized his phone and they went through it. And I guess it kind of goes to show those apps are not really secure, right? As they make it seem. But the, well, the thing is, too, with those apps, they might delete the trace of it, but it's still stored on your phone that's the thing with some of those things too if it's stored on your phone and they get your phone then you're i guess you're screwed indicated or contained in the phone there is also going back to the spring of 23 direct communications between mr kearney and mr yannetti and mr kearney and mr jackson they went out to lunch with mr kearney following a court date in may of 2023 and this is a person who counsel in the memo uh, seems to want to distance themselves from uh, based I'm presuming on subsequent indictments, but the truth is in, in the phone. The phone doesn't lie as far as those communications are concerned, as far as those communications uh, between counsel and between the defendant uh, in this particular case. So to say uh, that this is a different case, uh, again, I would suggest is a large uh, minimization of, of what actually has transpired here. Lastly, what I'll say in reference to the federal grand jury, uh, what is also clear from the uh, federal grand jury is that this was an investigation which was initiated by the defendant and Mr. Yannetti. So to claim that he was in the dark or didn't know about this federal investigation 
Every bit of discovery that the federal government has from the state case was provided by Mr. Yannetti. Nothing was asked for from the Commonwealth, nothing was asked for from the district attorney's office, the state police. So again, what I was intimating before in reference to the motion to dismiss, I have no idea what they have seen or what they haven't seen, how much of the file, how much of the discovery or anything else. It's all sort of been provided and colored uh, by Mr. Yannetti. And this goes back to November of 2022. So to then claim that you were sandbagged or didn't know about an investigation that you initiated over a year before until late in uh, December of 2023 is, I think disingenuous uh, is, disingenuous would be about the nicest term that I can come up with for that. Thank you. All right, Mr. Yannetti, a short um, rebuttal, I guess, or a short comment. I guess when I, I would just add, Your Honor, that um, the focus of Mr. Lally's argument was on everything except for Mr. Morrissey's conduct. Just like it doesn't matter if Mr. Morrissey and his office are actually targets of an investigation, it's only what he knew and believed. Similarly, with regard to his conduct in keeping secret the existence of a federal uh, investigation. It doesn't matter whether we knew about it or not. It's the fact that Morrissey knew, kept it secret for seven months, and didn't reveal it to the defense until the media got access to those letters. And with that, I would rest. Okay. Thank you. So I do have a question. Did you file the Rule 17 motions already, or do you expect to file them later today? We will be filing them by the close of business today. Okay, and they're pretty much outlined in your previous motion what you needed to file, or are there additional ones in your motion? I believe they're continue? outlined. Yeah, they're outlined, Judge. Okay, I ask because uh, Mr. Roach told me that on the March 20th date, um, the council wants it to be via Zoom. Um, I'd prefer it not be. Because with 20th. Rule 17, as you know, the, the record holders come into court and object. So I don't want you all to be on the screen. And Mr. Yannetti, certainly your local counsel. Mr. Jackson, if you want to be on the screen, you can. But I, I need somebody here. I understood you wrong. That's fine. Okay. That's it, fine. It makes sense to me. Yeah. Uh, if I may just say. Yes. Can I appear in person and have my client join me? No, she has to be here. Okay. Thank you, Judge. All right. Um, was there something else? Uh, do, yes. I, I would ask, may we approach just the, the scheduling issues? Okay. March 20th, huh? So, I'll put it in the calendar here. They change it now, but okay. this we might have time to watch a court TV video too that goes a little bit over the timeline I don't know if we have time to watch the turn boy interview I did your honor just all right, you had a question, Mr. Jackson? I did, Your Honor, just about the logistics of the trial, meaning days in trial, uh, half days, uh, five days a week, four days a week. I, I wanted to get some sort of sense so we can begin planning. Okay, uh, so we're program. going to go full days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, half days, okay. Tuesday, Thursday. Are the half days afternoon or half days morning? Mornings. Okay. Okay, anything else right now? That's interesting. So for the trial, half days, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and it'll be mornings. That'll actually make that 
easy to cover, I guess. I mean, there's like like breaks in between type of thing. We got early days. Morning. No, Your Honor, thank you. Anything from the Commonwealth? No, Your Honor. Mr. McDermott? Judge, I just wanted to put on the record that I, I think I provided to everyone uh, copies of that uh, letter from Google. I just wanted to make sure, just put that on the record that I gave you copies of that. Thank you. We received copies. Great. All right, great. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, please. All the board. Thank you. Okay. So I'm sending out the emails. By the way, if you're interested, consider joining the mailing list. We're at 640 something people. If you like that kind of thing, I just send out video notifications or announcements and upcoming stuff. All right. I'm sending out an email now or also Discord's a great place. Some people feel it's a little too technical, but it's a great place if you want to come hang out on Discord. All right. Now. Let's check out this video. I, I'm, I'm pretty interested in this trial because it's, it seems like it's going to be a mess. It's a mess. It is a mess with these cops. Are they going to have enough to find her guilty? She seems like she got good attorneys. Let's take, see if we can take a little look at this um, video. So, oh, we got a whole thing here. And okay, the defense is alleging a cover up. Okay, so now let's take a look at this visually because he's throwing a lot of names out there and it's a little confusing so i want to make it a little less confusing Please. um so the proctors are the the that's the trooper but what is his connection to the alberts and the mccabe's etc but who are these people so i'm in a good place to start the proctors brian albert nicole albert Sisters, Jennifer McCabe, Matt McCabe, married. These are sisters, Brian Albert, brothers with Christopher Albert and Julie Albert. They're married. Brothers with Christopher Albert, and then Julie's married to, okay. And they have a son. Now, Brian Albert and Nicole Albert are married with kids. Caitlin Albert, oh my. Lord almighty, okay. So this is the house where John O'Keefe was found dead on, on the lawn, okay? The owners of the house are Brian Albert and uh, Nicole Albert. They are married. Now, Brian Albert has a brother named Chris who's married to Julie. They have a son named... Jeez. All right, let me try to focus. <laughs> Brian Albert and dead on, on the lawn, okay? So this is the house where John O'Keefe was found dead on, on the lawn, okay? So John O'Keefe is found dead at this house where the party occurred and supposedly, you know, um, I don't think it's in question. Um, Karen dropped him off here. And there's no cameras, I guess. Somebody said that uh, I thought the, cross, the neighbors across had some cameras that didn't show them video, I guess. OK, the owners of the house are Brian Albert and uh, Nicole Albert. They are married. Now, Brian Albert has a brother named Chris who's married to Julie. They have a son named Colin. So Colin is an important name in all of this. Chris, Julie, um, again, brother of Brian Albert. Uh, Brian Albert and Nicole, they have uh, children, Caitlin Albert, Brian Albert Jr. And then there's a friend of theirs, Julie Nagel. Then you look at Nicole Albert, her sister, another- Sorry, not in the house, outside, I meant, sorry, you're right, outside important name in all this jennifer mccabe 
Jennifer McCabe, uh, who's married to Matt McCabe. So this is the house. So the night that John O'Keefe was got out of the car in front of the house and either went to the party or was murdered or run over um, by Karen Reed, who was in the house? Take a look. Uh, this is this is what's alleged here. Uh, Brian Albert's there. Nicole is there. Uh, Chris and Julie are not there, but their son, Colin, is there, which is Brian's nephew. Um, their kids are there, uh, Brian Albert Jr., Caitlin, and their friend Julie. Also there, very significant, is Jennifer McCabe and Matt McCabe. All of this, um, trying to understand the names, the relationships, and does it all lead to some conspiracy, bias, framing, planning evidence? Let's bring in our guests. Joining us in New York City, attorney, podcaster, Melanie Little is with us in Boston, Massachusetts, criminal defense attorney and author of the books Super Predators and Law and the Tough on Crime Myth. Peter Ellican is with us. And down in beautiful Jacksonville, Florida, retired FBI special agent Jennifer Koffendoffer. Great to have everyone here. Hello. All right, um, Melanie, I'll begin with you. So are we... So is the defense really predicated on the fact that Trooper Proctor, who was at a wedding and, and his family is, is close with the Alberts, is literally planting evidence to literally frame Karen Reed for murder? Is, is that what the defense is saying here, Melanie? I think that's exactly what they're saying. And they're, they're also saying that there are a lot of questions of fact here. You know, if well, Trooper there's Proctor, two things. who is the lead investigator. I, I, hate to, I hate to interrupt you. I just, want to, I just want to preface our entire conversation tonight. I'm not concerned about reasonable doubt, okay? Reasonable doubt, right. that, that's, I want to know about the truth tonight. Because the defense is saying John O'Keefe was murdered by people in that house. And the prosecution is saying he was murdered by Karen Reed. So I want to look at these as two cases and evaluate what's going on here. Let's begin with the defense case. So Melanie, go ahead. I'm sorry I interrupted you. Um, but I understand this is a case that's going to be tough uh, with reasonable doubt. But I want to get to the truth tonight. So what, what do you see in terms of these relationships? Is that enough? Like someone would do this? Frame this woman? Well, I... I, I can't see why anybody would find it so beyond the pale that it could never actually happen. I mean, if it is true that Michael Proctor, who's the lead investigator on this case, has close ties to the Albert family and to the McCabe family, everyone inside that house was a relative except for one person. So if the defense can show that there are close second family type ties between everyone in that house and the lead investigator on this case, that could be something that uh, definitely could lead to reasonable doubt. I know you don't want to go there, but yeah, that's exactly I, I, again, what I'm not concerned about the reasonable doubt tonight. Not tonight. When we get to the trial, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll get to it. I'm trying to figure out the truth here, Peter, because I've got Alan Jackson, a former prosecutor who was amazing out in California, jumping up and down literally on the courtroom steps, telling us that the prosecution has it all wrong. The DA has this all wrong and that it's the police who are responsible here. Well, yeah, first of all, I'd say that there was such a conflict of interest here. I, even the appearance of bias, I don't know why uh, Trooper Proctor was in charge of this investigation. There's just too many ties we saw that we just. Well, the defense is saying he's in charge because he's framing Karen Reed. That's mm. why. Mm. He's not going to give up the and, lead on this because oh. he's got to save, um, you know, his friend and his friend's son and whoever else they're, they, they're going to allege did this and, and frame somebody for this. Yeah, and I, I guess that's, I, I think we've all been seeing enough cases over the years that it's not absolutely beyond the pale that some police officer may not be truthful. So... Um, Wait, there's a difference, up, though. This is a difference between not being truthful forgetting something and literally taking evidence and putting it somewhere so you can frame someone for murder, take away their liberty and put them in jail for the rest of their life. This is different you than just making a mistake. A do that to protect a friend though, or your long-term friends with the family. We saw it goes way, way back. And his mother is saying that the Alberts are a second family to her. And we have uh, one of the family members, Jennifer McCabe, going to his house, who goes to a state trooper's whole personal home uh, to go chat with them, and it is not even reported in any paperwork. So with those kinds of biased ties, um, 
it, would there be a motive? Could anybody do that to protect their friends? I want to know what Jennifer Carfidaff would think. I want to know her expertise. To protect people you've known for years. And, it, and that's why when the DA here has said that it's a lie, if you see any connection between him and the family, the facts just don't bear that out. Yeah, that was baffling. Uh, and I'm glad you mentioned that. Let's take a listen to Alan Jackson today <laughs> talking about uh, that meeting on September 25th of last year. On September 25th, 2023, that one of those family members, Jennifer McCabe, who's the subject uh, of great interest in this case and a primary person of interest in this case, is invited to Trooper Proctor's personal home for some sort of off the books meeting. They've now admitted that Jennifer McCabe, a central character in the middle of this investigation, in the middle of this crime, was secretly meeting and or socializing with the lead investigator and or his wife in the living room of their home. And that, Your Honor, is a problem. Okay, Jennifer, let me ask you, should, should we be concerned, when I say we, the public, that the DA comes out and says there's no, there's no relationship with the family here, um, Proctor had nothing to do with what was going on that day, and it seems that that's not necessarily true, and then um, McCabe going to Proctor's house, I mean, should there be some concern here? I think it's very important to truly understand the relationship. Brian Albert, who lived in the house where this incident occurred out in the front, his brother's wife's sister was friends with Proctor's sister. Okay, that's how far removed. I just hope your audience, uh, oh, the attorney, one more time, one more time, one more time. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Uh -oh. Okay. We'll do it Brian together. Albert brother's wife's sister was friends with Proctor's sister, okay? That's how far removed. It, in other words, I could tell you, I have no idea who my sister-in-law's <laughs> sister's friends are. I, I mean, there's no way, I couldn't tell you one of them. I don't even know my sister-in-law's friends. And, and we're very close. So my point is, this is how far removed it is. Mm. And then it's, again, Proctor's sister. A detective Proctor, I'm sorry, Trooper Proctor and Brian Albert, the home again. They had never even met each other. The pictures you're showing are his brother's family, his brother's family. And again, that's through this, you know, removed relationships. So I think it's very important uh, to understand that just because you have a Proctor there and an Albert there, they're not the same family unit. Second of all, everybody's forgetting about Brian Higgins. That chart, you're missing the ATF agent that was there. And that's very important too. So to have this conspiracy work, we have to have oh. a Boston police officer, Canton police, EMS, an ATF agent, the medical examiner's office, oh. the district attorney, and the state police all combined to do this huge conspiracy against who? Nothing against Karen Reed, but who is Karen Reed? Karen Reed is... She's a lady you all hear talking about on a panel, all you experts, and everybody's covering, talking about all over the place. Is no one special other than she was dating in a relationship that was falling apart the victim deceased. Okay, There's everyone stay where you are. We've, we've got to hit a quick break. Right. We've got to hit a quick break. When we come back, much, much more. Uh, don't go anywhere. All right. I know Alana's been following the case, and she's been uh, on Discord, too, posting information on the on the form that we have for this case. I asked her, like, what's her thoughts? She says, Can Karen is innocent. This case is so corrupt. The prosecution, DA, and company can't even keep up with the lies. Wow. Anywhere. To coordinate. We're here in Canton, Massachusetts. This is just outside of Boston. And on January 28, 2022, Karen Reed and John O'Keefe later they walk away now and they make their way over here to CF McCarthy's Bar and Grill and they meet up with Jennifer and Matthew McCabe. 
Around midnight, the bars begin to close. So everybody is invited back to Jennifer's sister's house, which, according to GPS, is about an eight-minute drive. Let's go check it out. They eventually make their way here to Fairview Road in Canton and at this house. This house was owned by Brian and Nicole Albert. At the time, Brian was a good friend of theirs and also a police officer. Now what happens next is what this case is all about. Prosecutors say that the couple actually got into a fight and when O'Keefe exited the car, Karen Reed backed over him, leaving him to die in the curb here in front of this house during the snowstorm. Police collected a lot of evidence at the scene, including what appeared to be a broken cocktail glass with blood around it, and also a broken taillight. Now, Reed says when she pulled up to the house here, she wanted to know if the couple was really invited. It was late at night. So she watched John O'Keefe walk up to the front door over there. And when he didn't return to the car and didn't return her phone call, that's when she said she went to his house and fell asleep. The next morning, Karen Reed hasn't heard from John, so she starts making phone calls, and then she comes back here to the last place she says that she saw him, over at this house on Fairview. And that's when he's discovered, lying in the snow dead. Now, Reed's defense says a very different story. They say that John was actually beaten up in the basement of this house and attacked by the family dog. They claim that he was dragged outside and left in the snow to die. Man. So it's true that they remodeled the basement? I saw some people saying that. The basement got remodeled. The house, I think, is sold now. Now, being here on Fairview Road in Canton, a few things come to mind. Why didn't someone see anything? Because the neighborhood, it's, it's fairly dense. The houses are close together. But you have to keep in mind that this happened in January, in the middle of the night, and it was also a snowstorm, whiteout conditions. Now, another key for the defense is the snowplow driver who said that he cleared Fairview Road here the morning that John O'Keefe was found dead. He claims that he didn't see a body in the road or near the road. Okay, all my guests back with us, Melanie Little, Peter Ellican, and Jennifer Koffendoffer. Uh, Melanie, which case is easier to prove? That he was murdered in the house or that he was murdered by Karen Reed? I have so many questions. I think it's easier to prove that he was murdered in the house. Tell in me my why. opinion. Ooh. I mean, where's the dog? Where's the dog? I saw the, the photos of John Proctor's right arm that were taken at his autopsy. They have what clearly looks to me to be like animal scratches on them. What you mean? I guess she means up. Uh, uh, okay. All of a sudden, the family dog of seven years, they had a German Shepherd in the house. The family dog is gone. They rehomed the dog. The dog is missing. The dog's DNA cannot be tested to see if those were, in fact, animal scratches. You know, there's a cocktail glass, allegedly, on the lawn. Mm. They never searched the inside of the house. Why did they never go inside the house to see if they had those type of glasses inside the house? Why was the basement flooring ripped up? The house was sold. Why did this police officer who owned the house and his wife never come out of their house to look at the scene when there is a dead police officer on their lawn. I have so many questions. And I think at the end of the day, it's a jury's, the jury is gonna to have to decide the facts. And if we have so many questions from looking at these facts, I think a jury is gonna have a lot of questions too. So the, the dog's MIA now, nobody knows where the dog is. Supposedly remodeled and sold the house. So uh, the basement is sold, oh. Yeah. Jennifer, which case is easier to prove? Mm. Oh. Uh, without a doubt, the case that he was hit by uh, Karen Reed. She had the motive. These are not dog scratches. Uh, that has been said. And that's been a big point of contention as well. I don't know. What do you guys think in the chat? We still got about 20 minutes before the next live stream. Um, Y'all think that's dog bites? I, I saw some comparisons to people were taking, showing pictures of other people that were actually bitten, but like we know for a fact were bitten by dogs and comparing it. And it's hard to say. It kind of looks similar, man. Somewhat similar.
by two medical examiners, separate medical examiners that examined him. Also, well, they, say, they said it's not. Uh, without a doubt, the case that he was hit by uh, Karen Reed. She had the motive. These are not dog scratches. Uh, that has been said by two medical examiners, separate medical examiners that examined him. Also, uh, there were samples sent to a lab in California to test for non-human or canine DNA. Negative. Um, so I find it so mm. interesting that people want to look at a picture and all of a sudden they're medical examiners, they're doctors with PhDs, and they can say these are dog scratches. Um, se second to uh, the point there, the Albert, uh, Brian Albert, they sold their house months and months after that. Also, they had a leak downstairs in the basement that resulted in uh, quite a lot of damage, and that's why the flooring was replaced. As far as the dog, Chloe, Chloe got into a fight with another dog in that neighborhood. And during that fight, one of the neighbors went to separate the two dogs and was scratched or bitten. And it was decided amongst the people that they would go ahead and rehome the dog as opposed to making uh, an even larger deal out of it. Mm. So they got rid of the dog because the dog got into a fight with somebody else in the neighborhood. Man, this case just goes on and on and on and on and on. Wow. So there are very logical explanations, but these are the types of innuendos that have been completely blown up. All right. So Jennifer's not buying it. She's not buying it. She's not convinced. Um, one more thing. Let's take a little look at this. I think we have time to watch the whole thing, but I just want to take a glimpse. Bum, bum. I'm Betty Politan. Thank you for joining us. Get ready. Get set. This is a big hour. It's a big oh. hour. We're starting big. Um, now, I'm going to preface this once again. Every time I do this story, I mm, it was snowing. What the F? No long sleeves. What's DNA in that? What DNA in those scratches? I have to say it. My sole purpose in covering this story. And my sole goal, my perspective, my point of view is just to find out the truth, period. I have no other agenda. I'm not on one side. I'm not on the other yeah, be side. Careful. Be I'm careful. Be careful. Don't pick a side. Truth, now. Whatever it is. And hopefully at some point we will find out and a jury will tell us what the truth is. So I'm talking about the case of Karen Reed. Karen Reed. That's her boyfriend, John O'Keefe. He's a Boston police officer. She was a professor and a professional. Um, they went out one night bar hopping. She then drops him off at a house. Or he gets out of the car. Prosecutors say she ran him over, murdered him on purpose after she let him out of the car. She says he went into the house and was killed in there, and she's now being framed for the murder. That's the story here. She says she's being framed by the people that are inside that house who were other police officers and family members. Prosecutors say she murdered him, ran him over on purpose and left him to die in the cold. So this is the case where we are seeing something we've never seen before. An accused cop killer, even before the trial starts, just dozens and hundreds of protesters showing up at the courthouse supporting her. Take a look. Wow, he's like a celebrity. Oh, you see that? Oh, who holds long for justice? What? Holds long to die in cold. Oh, how how long to die in cold? They're talking about the text. Um. What I did see it was interesting too. They said, Where's Chloe, the dog? Wow. Wow, this is serious out there. And the man leading those demonstrations has subsequently gotten arrested and charged with witness intimidation and some other charges. And he's joining us tonight. Let's bring in our special guest, blogger, social media personality, owner of TB Daily News, and the man 
who organized the Karen Reed protest. Joining us today from Worcester, Mass., Aiden Carney, a.k.a. Turtle Boy. Great to see you, uh, Turtle Boy. Um, you were locked up for a while. How long were you locked up? I did 60 days, Vinny. 60, 60 days? Odd days. All right. Now you're 60. here tonight. So I've been reporting on a lot of allegations against you and about you. So I want to talk about some of those and have you respond. And, and I want to begin with the relationship between you and Karen Reed. What exactly uh, this is about? Because in an affidavit that was filed by the Commonwealth, they are alleging that Karen Reed provided to you non-public information using an intermediary um, a, a woman named Natalie. Uh, you're using the secret text messaging app that terrorists use. Oh my um, God! You made terrorists 189 use. phone calls. We want to get you money for your car oh, accident um, injuries, and we want to get you to Karen your money Reed. For <laughs> and you spoke to her in excess of 40 hours. And then a woman named Jane, who I believe is your ex, stated that you run everything by Karen Reed before. Wow. You what post anything before you say anything. You run it by her, and you two are kind of in cahoots together. Well, first of all, I laughed out loud when you said that Signal is a terrorist app. It's one of the most commonly used encrypted apps for a reason, because people don't want big brother government coming into their homes with guns, taking their devices and reading all their text messages. That's why people use Signal. And the two sources that they have uh, that the government is using, Lindsay and Natalie, are two of the least credible people on earth. And God forbid, Vinny, that a reporter, an award-winning journalist, speak to the subject of his reporting on the phone. Karen and Reed, yes, guilty as charged. I, as a journalist, interviewed several times and spoke with the subject of my reporting. She asked to remain anonymous, and I honored her anonymity because that's what I do as a journalist. If she gave me information on the record, I reported it. If she gave me information off the record, I didn't report it. Mystery solved. This is a, uh, an investigation without a crime. Uh, this is a pathetic last-ditch attempt by the Commonwealth. Uh, they're going down, and they know it, and they're trying to basically smear my credibility and smear Karen Reed's credibility to try to save themselves, but it's not going to work. Okay. So you're saying, yeah, you were having these conversations, but it's like any other journalist who's going to talk to a source who could be the person related to all of it. I get that. I believe in the First Amendment myself, being a journalist and a lawyer uh, who believes in the Constitution. Um, but were you together figuring out a way to go after people? Was she saying, go after this one, no. go after that one? I want you to confront this person. Oh, the fantasy world these people live in, Vinny. Uh, no, I, if, you, if you're new, I've been doing Turtle Boy for about 10 years. I existed long before Karen Reed. I do not work for Karen Reed. I work for Turtle Boy, the brand. Karen Reed has absolutely zero control over the content on my website. When I went and I interviewed these people, when I went up to them and asked them, and this is what I'm being charged with, Vinny. I'm being charged with witness intimidation because I asked questions to people who, quite frankly, according to the evidence, appear to have murdered a Boston police officer and covered it up after the fact. Okay, let me, let, me stop, let me stop you there because I, I want to get into that, and I want folks to know what we're talking about for those that don't know the story here. Um, you've been charged with eight counts of intimidation of a witness, five counts of picketing a witness, three Nine. counts... Nine counts, uh, three counts of conspiracy to intimidate a witness. Um, I, want, I want you to take a look at this because episode 594 is one of the ones that they cite from the TB News, from your, your uh, Turtle Boy Live on YouTube. I want to take a look at a little clip so folks have a little bit of an idea of what they are claiming is the behavior um, that is inappropriate and is intimidating witnesses in this case. Doug, this is not my last trip to Canton. I will be back. Oh, I, I'll be back, Miss uh, <laughs> Miss Boys Regular. I'll be back. Like, get used to this. Like, these people think I'm around. Like, I'm Mr. Internet Guy. All right. So, what the the language you use? What is what is the end yeah, game? I, like the the end game that you have in terms of going back. 
Um, and, I've, and I've watched a lot well, of the clips where you're, you're using language, and you're gonna make like difficult for them. You, you're going to um, high school games and the, the parents are watching their kids and you're going there. What's, what's the end game to all that? The end game is to ask people questions, Vinny, to, to figure out who killed John O'Keefe and hold these people responsible for it. The end game, what I just said in that clip, this is how much the government lies about this. I was not talking about any of the quote unquote witnesses there. I was talking about a DPW employee who didn't want to do their job that day. And I made it very clear, if you're going to, they were basically giving me the runaround, and I said, I'll be back next week. I'll be back the week after that. If you don't want to give me these public records, which I'm entitled to as a journalist, I will keep coming back. I was not referring to any of the quote unquote witnesses there. That's how dishonest the government is. The boy's regular person I was referring to is the woman behind the desk. She's a government employee. She's not a witness to anything. She has nothing to do with the Karen Reed case. And by the way, Vinny, I was there to find out who plowed Fairview Road the night of January, or the morning of January 29th, 2022, because they never interviewed the plow driver. And guess what? Two months later, I found that driver. His name is Brian Lucky Lochran. He plowed Fairview Road at 2.30 in the morning. He went right by the house and John O'Keefe's body was not on the front lawn. He also told me in an exclusive interview that he saw a Ford Edge parked directly next to where John O'Keefe's body would be discovered three hours later. And he had been interviewed by the FBI about that. And why didn't the state police find this guy? Why didn't they track this guy down? Because they didn't want to track him down. Because his information, his testimony proved that John O'Keefe was not killed by Karen Reed at 1230 because he was not on that lawn at 230. And since breaking this story in August of 2022, the state police to this day have done zero work to find out who was driving that Ford Edge parked right next to John O'Keefe's body at three in the morning. You know why, Vinny? Because they're too busy calling up ex-girlfriends of mine and, and someone named Natalie and finding out how many times I talked to Karen Reed as if that matters. Why don't they find out who's driving that Ford Edge? Don't they want to know who killed the Boston police officer? Because as sure as heck wasn't Karen Reed because there was nobody on the lawn at 2.30. That's what I was doing in that clip. Actual journalism that no other reporter is willing to do and no police in this case are willing to do. All right, I'm going to show folks another clip um, that was cited again, episode 598. Um, again, this is one where you're talking about Chris Albert um, looking for turtle riders who are your followers. Let's let's watch it. He's got this guy's got his head on a swivel everywhere now. He's like turtle riders. Where are they? I got bad news for you, Chris. I got really bad news for you. They're literally everywhere. You can't like you guys should just stop going out in public. Like that'd be my recommendation, and it's only going to get worse from here. It's only going to, I did not direct this person to do this. I can't stop them. They're everywhere. They don't like you. Nobody likes you. You guys killed someone. You like, you literally killed someone. Not you. You didn't do it. You, you raised someone who did it. And, you know, your big bro did it. But like, and you obviously know this and you're helping to cover it up. But I guess you didn't kill anyone. So you got that going for you. So good job, Chris. You just raised the killer. Anyway. And we're going to get to that too. But he's obviously, when I saw him, like this dude is ready and like looking around. They insist on going out in public. Like, Chris, I know where you guys were today. Y'all were in Agawam, weren't you? I got pictures of you on my cell phone. I got people sending me pictures. You guys were at some sort of little league thing in Agawam. I got pictures of Courtney, uh, Courtney Proctor. I got pictures of, who is she with there? Um... I forget. There's a whole crew here. Alberts, McCabe's, all you people were there. So, like, ju just know that there will be no – life as normal is over, okay? Life is normal. You had normal for a while there from January 29th till about April. January 29th, 2022 till April of 2023. You guys literally got away with murder, okay? All right. Let, let, let's, let's talk about this now. Life's not going to be normal for you. you. People are taking pictures. Yeah. You know you've got all these followers. Um, yeah. Are you concerned that, when, that they're being doxxed? That wait, 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 I'm just let me finish the question. Like, right, are you that. concerned that it can become a dangerous situation and someone would be intimidated from coming forward and saying, "Listen, I got to get out of here. I don't want any part of this anymore," because that's what they're alleging here. No, is that I'm you're never, intimidating these folks I've never, to the point that they will no longer be able to be witnesses. Damn. So we gotta actually we have to jump over to the new stream. 
I didn't see all of Biff Thunder Muffin's messages, but what Biff was saying, I believe, I didn't see all the stuff at the top. He was just making a point um, that if you don't consider that intimidation, so post your address here in the, in the public chat and see. Um, if somebody does that, I mean, we'll block the message that they post, but he was just making a point. Uh, I, I think, too, with this case, what happens to you with um, Karen Reed is that if anybody disagrees and thinks that she's guilty, then people pile on that person. Um, it's OK to disagree with that. I don't know. I don't know if that's what's happening in the chat, but I feel I still want to see more things presented, but it, it's definitely a super weird case. I like what Vinny's doing here, too, with this interview, um, giving him a chance, bringing up points for him. Try to boy to clear up for the questions that people have about the charges that he had. So I guess I'll have to finish watching this at some point. But it, it is a really, really weird. <laughs> Vinny thinks he's interviewing a terrorist. And you got timed up by accident, um, Biff. So, okay, we're going to teleport over at five o'clock, this thing. Or it, has, it hasn't started yet still. We can still watch a little bit of this until they're ready to start. I don't know how long this hearing is going to last. Alec Baldwin and production company Eldorado Pictures have filed a motion to state proceedings and civil lawsuit against them pending outcome. Yeah, I'm surprised it's actually starting this late. Hearing civil case. And I have no notifications, so I'm going to need you guys to um, help me out with the new stream. Restaurant says, well, his point was is horrible, but if he wants to come to my house, so be it. <laughs> it's weird since I'm not involved in this case. Yeah, you guys are crazy. I think there there's there's people on both sides of the story. I, I actually see the point he was trying to make. Um I I don't know enough so I don't want to uh really give too much of an opinion yet. I think I'm going to learn more and more. I don't know if it's true about this witness intimidation thing, but it, it's dangerous, you know, it can make a case for the prosecution. I mean, that's all it seems the prosecution was complaining about instead of trying to prove Okay, it's actually time now. Let me transfer you guys. Let's go over. It's time. I'll see you guys over there on the second, the new stream. By the way, I have a feeling there's going to be some chases going on, man, because multiple times today, something starts to stop, start stops. I feel like we might get something later. So make sure you're subscribed to the second channel. Okay. I'm going to move you guys over. <laughs> Lana, you don't hear him or her in other chats arguing. 